genuine pleasure to welcome Cora Beth Fraser, who's an associate lecturer at the Open University, where they have an astounding classics department uh, with lots of lecturers, associate lecturers, uh, and a wealth of experience of teaching uh, in, in a various range of demographics of students. And we heard from Susan DC and Lisa Maurice. Um, the other week, uh, the other week, the other day, about um, their work working with autistic children. And what I wanted to have was this masterclass uh, where we heard from Cora Beth, who's done a lot of work in this area, where she's going to explain to us and take us through some of the uh, areas um, that she's come across in teaching uh, students with autism uh, and about autism and so on. And this is something that's a really prominent feature of all our teaching, whether we're teaching in universities or in high schools or primary schools or generally in other contexts. So I'm going to hand straight over to you, Cora Beth. And we have, I think we have about 35 minutes. So 11.35 is, is key end points. Brilliant. Thanks, April. Um, I do have a clock in front of me. I'm going to look at the clock, I promise. Um, I have a nasty habit of just, <laughs> of just talking. Um, so no, um, yeah, I'm Cora Beth and I'm autistic and I'm also the parent of an autistic child. And that's not how I would normally introduce myself in an academic context. I would usually say I'm a classicist, but it's directly relevant to what I want to talk about today. Um, I'm a classicist. I also have several degrees in education. Um, so what I'm interested in is really the point where classics, education, and autism intersect. Um, so today I want to talk about the story of um, Theseus and the Minotaur. Uh, right, okay, I'm just gonna try to share my screen. It should be fun. Um, Right. Um, hopefully you can see my slide. Yeah, that's working. Yeah. Yes. OK. Um, <laughs> right. Um, so what I want to talk about um, really is, is in part what does um, the labyrinth uh, represent? Well, Often in psychoanalytic readings of uh, this myth, of which there are many, the labyrinth stands for the mind. Um, and the minotaur lurking in the center of the labyrinth is standing for, well, all sorts of things that might be lurking in the psyche. Um, but this causes a few problems when we start thinking about autistic children, and it can be dangerously misleading, um, as I will explain. Um, so I would like you to do something for me, uh, if you don't mind. Um, first, I'd like you all to switch off your cameras for a while. Um, and I'm going to do the same. Um, I, have, I have reasons for this. Uh, so if you wouldn't mind switching off your cameras. Um, and I'd also like you to pull up the chat box so that you can see it. Um, there should be a... a button at the bottom that you can click and then you can move it around and make it bigger. Um, so I'd like you to be able to see the slides and also see the chat box. Um, so I'd like you to use the chat box to, to talk to me as I'm going through this and, you know, tell me things, heckle, mention things that I should read, whatever you, you come up with. Um, the third thing I'd like you to do is I'd like you to use the chat box to tell me something about your environment right now. Um, not geographical details. I don't know that. need to know that much. But are you at home? Are you in uh, your office? Are you on a train? Um, are you surrounded by other people? Are you alone? Um, give me some idea of, of what it is that you are... Um, uh, you, the situation that you're in. Um, okay, we've got one at home. Um, who else is at home? <laughs> Always good to have a cat. I have two. Fortunately, they're not here because they're very loud. Uh, if they do appear, you will no doubt hear them. Um, <laughs> where is everybody else? Um, at home is, is helpful 
um, because this is what I want to talk about. I want to talk about control of um, the world around you. So um, I'm controlling what we're doing um, in the sense that I've asked you to switch your cameras off and I've switched my own camera off. And this is important to me because I find it very difficult to talk when people are looking at me. Um, <laughs> no worries, Melissa. Um, I find it very difficult to, um, to keep my expression the way it's supposed to be uh, while still talking. So normally my expression is all over the place and I'm waving my hands and I'm, I'm doing all kinds of things. And I feel like I can't do that when people are looking at me. Also, eye contact is a problem for a lot of autistic people. Um, we sometimes find it very uncomfortable to have to look into somebody's eyes. And you can imagine how that works on Zoom. It, it's constant. Um, it's, it's constant eye contact all the time from multiple people. And it, it's, it's very disconcerting. Um, so the next thing that I would like you to do, and don't worry, I will, I will stop making you participate in things in a minute. <laughs> but the last thing that I would like you to do is to think about how you're feeling physically at this moment. Is something bothering you? Um, do you have, um, is the light too bright? Um, do your feet hurt? Are you feeling a bit hot? Do you need a drink? Um, what is, is there something physically that's niggling at you? Um, you don't have to tell me about it, but what I'd like you to do is just do something to fix it. Nobody can see you. You know, go get a, a cushion and put it on your chair or, or find something to put your feet on or turn the main light off or just, just do something physically to make that niggle go away. And you can tell me about it in the chat box if you like, although you don't have to. Um, no, it, it's not so much um, that people are judging. It, it's, it's more um, a matter of multiple forms of, um, <laughs> yes, I can understand that, Melissa, is multiple forms of input and, and many things to concentrate on. Um, a lot of autistic people, they, they try very hard to mimic the behaviors of other people. And that's what I try to do. I try to look like everybody else when I'm presenting something. And it's hard work because it's not natural. And so it, it's like, you know, patting your head and rubbing your stomach at the same time. It's, it's very um, challenging logistically. Um, but also, you know, there is this sense of making eye contact, which is, is very jarring. It, it's, um, it's almost too personal. Um, and it, it's, it's very, it's difficult to explain and it's not shared by all autistic people, but predominantly, yes. Um, okay, so now that I'm kind of getting you to focus on the, the physical aspect of things, um, that's really what I want to say about um, uh, the dangers of separating the body from the mind in thinking about autistic children, because autistic children experience sensory input really, really strongly. So something that might be a minor annoyance to you could be so much the focus of their attention that they can't think about anything else, um, that they just can't function. It can be a smell, it can be a light, it can be, there's all kinds of things and different people have different sensitivities, but as soon as you start separating the body from the mind, you're on the wrong track because um, autistic children are in many ways more plugged into their environment um, than other children. So all this takes me back to um, stories and the stories that we tell and why they're important. And so I thought that I would just for a moment um, tell you a story. Uh, <laughs> if you don't mind. Um, I want to tell you a, a, a personal story that, that came to mind when I was um, putting these slides together. Um, it's not deeply personal, you know, I'm, I'm not going to cry or anything. <laughs> it's all right, you're safe. Um, <laughs> but um, what, I, what I want to, to say is, is um, maybe kind of an illustrative anecdote of when my son was, was small and uh, he had lots of problems and I spent a lot of time taking him to 
doctor's appointments and therapy and all kinds of, of appointments and, and um, situations where we had to go and see somebody about something. And before all of those, um, there was an expectation that he would be weighed and measured. <laughs> it was like a standard thing. You know, you would sit in a waiting room before your appointment, the nurse would come out and take him into a separate room to be weighed and measured. And uh, every single time, as soon as the nurse came out, he would dive under a chair and refuse to come out. Um, <laughs> it was, you know, it was like clockwork every single time. And, and, and people um, complained greatly at me. And, and I, I went into parenting overdrive, you know. I, it was um, a standard thing by that point. It was like, what strategy can we put in place to, to make this work? And so um, we did role playing, we did practicing, we did watching videos on YouTube, we did all kinds of things, social stories, which are really interesting uh, way into um, uh, helping autistic children. And so all of that. And in the end, um, it worked. Um, managed to get him to go and get weighed and measured. Um, and everyone was so proud. They were so, they were so proud of us, both of us. You know, we'd, we'd, we'd done what we were supposed to, to do, and it was all great. And it wasn't till quite a lot later that I really looked back on that and thought, why on earth did I do that? Um, you know, what, what, was, what was the point? My child was communicating with me. He couldn't talk. It was entirely nonverbal. He couldn't talk um, for, for years. And... Um, you know, he couldn't actually explain what he was feeling, but it was blindingly obvious that he didn't want to get weighed and measured. And the look that he used to give me was a look of total kind of disgust um, along the lines of why on earth would I need to be weighed and measured? And it was a fair point. You know, you, you could tell that he was normal weight and height just by looking at him. Um, there was no need for it at all. It was just a regulation that required some compliance. And my focus was on making him comply. And his focus was on avoiding something that he didn't see the point of. And it wasn't till a lot later that I started to think maybe he was right and I was wrong. And so that's something that I want to kind of bear in mind as I, I go through this. The sense that autistic children do communicate. They may not communicate in the way that you want them to, but they do communicate and they maybe have something valid to say. So taking this back to um, the labyrinth myth, I'm interested in what tools the labyrinth myth gives us for accessing, interpreting or validating the experiences of um, autistic children. Um, and it, it does all of those things in, in different ways. Um, but before I, before I go on, I should probably ask you um, if you're familiar with the story of um, Theseus and the Minotaur and the Labyrinth. Um, I don't want to ramble on if you don't know the story. Um, <laughs> thank you, Melissa. Um, I, I don't want to, uh, you know, tell you all the, the story in detail if you, if you know it. But uh, OK, well, the, the basics of the story... Um, uh, there is a half bull, half man uh, creature called Minotaur at the center of a great maze um, it, under the, the palace of, of King Minos. And um, uh, every so often, uh, sources differ on how often, um, a certain number, again, <laughs> sources differ on that, a certain number of boys and girls were sent from Athens into the, the maze uh, for the Minotaur to eat. And uh, eventually, um, the king's son, Theseus, in Athens, went along as a volunteer with these um, sacrificial victims and um, uh, went to kill the Minotaur. And um, he was aided in this by the daughter of King Minos, Ariadne, um, who gave him a thread and she told him to attach the thread to the, the edge of the labyrinth and to hold the thread as he went through the labyrinth. And then when he'd killed the Minotaur, he could follow the thread back 
to escape the labyrinth because otherwise he'd be trapped forever. Um, and so Theseus did kill the Minotaur and he did escape and he took Ariadne um, with him. Um, <laughs> of course, I'm leaving out many details, um, particularly uh, how the Minotaur came into being and also what happened to Ariadne after Theseus took her away. <laughs> but I can't do everything in 35 minutes. So, <laughs> so that's the basic story. So you've got a hero, you've got a princess, you've got a monster, you've got a labyrinth that people um, uh, get lost in and get eaten in. Um, so that's your kind of basic framework. Um, it's a useful story when applied to autistic children because um, it models this idea of being a hero. And anyone who's listened, listened to Susan and Lisa talk about their use of the Hercules myth in working with autistic children, we'll see the similarities. Uh, Lisa's also done some work in Israel with uh, using this particular myth um, to talk about how um, autistic children deal with fear. Um, so the idea is that they can put themselves in the position of the hero. Um, this is linked to issues of empowerment and control. And another really big thing is that it also offers the female role Without Ariadne's cleverness, Theseus couldn't have escaped the labyrinth. Now, the issue of gender is a big one when we're talking about autistic children and autistic adults. Um, for a very long time, the whole public conception of autism was dominated by the model of boys, particularly white boys. So we have a racial aspect to it as well. Um, and so anyone who didn't fit the stereotype was often um, undiagnosed. And so that's why you see so many women, um, grown women, getting a diagnosis now because they were missed when they were children. And to some extent, it, it still happens. So um, the issue of representing girls is a really important one. There's also the thread the thread that Theseus follows to escape the labyrinth. This is often used when the, the myth is picked in um, some um, materials. It's often represent therapy or guidance or training or some kind of intervention which gives the child a way out of the situation that they're in. Um, so this also plugs into ideas of escape and freedom and how we get out of a situation that we're not happy in. So it's an empowering sort of myth when used to uh, deal with um, autistic children and to help them and to represent the struggles that they go through. There's also the attraction of mazes, which is great fun. Um, Mazes are very often associated with autism on all kinds of different levels. It's a really interesting area. Um, they can be used to represent the maze of autism support and intervention, so the, the medical maze, if you like. They can represent the social world um, and the challenges of navigating it if you don't really understand the rules. So that's often a way in which the, the labyrinth is applied to autism. On a practical level, doing mazes, you know, solving a maze puzzle is often used as a way of soothing autistic children. Um, <laughs> I have to say, it never worked with mine, <laughs> but uh, it's, it's a, seen as a, a quite a practical intervention to, to calm autistic children who are maybe struggling with um, complex input. The, this is a very uh, focused way of uh, settling. Uh, complex emotions. Research has even been conducted on how autistic people navigate mazes, physical mazes that they end up in. Yes, they actually put the autistic people in the maze <laughs> and um, uh, watch them try and get out of it. Um, I have many things to say about this, none of which I'm going to say. <laughs> Don't get me started. Uh, but yes, it, it <laughs> oh, that's really interesting, Melissa. Um, I'm not remotely surprised, um, but that, that's very interesting. 
Um, yes, we are quite good at mazes, it seems, if you dump us in the middle of one. Um, sometimes mazes also stand for confusion, uh, the confusion of the child or the confusion of the parent, both. There's this book by um, Oliver de la Paz, which I entirely recommend. It's called The Boy in the Labyrinth, and it's, um, it's, it's poetry um, of a, a sort. It, it's quite um, complex in its uh, forms, but it's, um, it's fabulous. It's, um, it's written by a man who has two autistic children, and this is really a kind of articulation of... Um, uh, how he understands autism, how he processes what his children are, are going through and tries to relate to them. And it, it's, a, it's fascinating. It's not an autistic perspective, but it's the closest I've ever seen from someone who's not autistic. It's, it's really interesting. Um, but um, the labyrinth gives us uh, what I think of as a reversible myth, um, a way of kind of switching the, the perspective um, which I think is is useful. Um, so, okay, what do you see? Duck or a rabbit? <laughs> Duck or rabbit? <laughs> there's, there's probably some kind of um, psychological um, element to this, but if so, I don't know what it is. <laughs> which one do you see first? <laughs> if, it, if it helps, I see the duck. Um, <laughs> I have to work a bit to see the rabbit. Um, I'm always fascinated by these things. Oh, we've got more ducks. Yay. <laughs> Brilliant. Um, I don't know what that says about us. Ooh, rabbit. That probably means something very deep. Um, <laughs> anyway, I did have loads of these, but I cut them out because they were not remotely relevant. But they are fun. Um, so the Minotaur is a monster, as we've seen. Um, he's at the center of this uh, possibly um, ecological, possibly not, maze. Um, he's often used to represent uh, fear, as I mentioned, um, emotion uh, em or emotional regulation. Uh, the autism itself, internal, internal threat, um, violence, rage, uncontrolled sexual desire, isolation, all kinds of things that essentially need to be dealt with or confronted, uh, perhaps with, with bravery. Um, so it's used in ways. I've included lots of minotaurs here, which I would love to tell you all about, but we'd need another two hours. Um, <laughs> but if we flip it, the minotaur is also a child with a family. And this aspect is also represented in the sources. Um, I had to include this um, image from an Etruscan um, vessel, which is um, extremely popular in the world of classics. And um, it's the baby minotaur. And everybody loves the baby minotaur. So if you come out of this with just one thing, it should be the knowledge that baby minotaur exists out there. Um, Baby Minotaur is brilliant. So um, this sense of the Minotaur as a child is important. The Minotaur doesn't, you know, appear fully formed as a monster. The Minotaur has a backstory. And the Minotaur was once a baby. And um, lots of representations of the Minotaur, they pick up on the, the sympathetic elements, the, um, the pathos of the half man, um, half bull creature that um, that is killed. Um, they they pick up on the isolation. They pick up on lots of different elements, and you know it gives me an excuse to use Burn Jones's wonderful illustration of the little minotaur peeking out from behind the wall, which is one of my favourites. Um, so <laughs> the minotaur is often seen as a victim. Um, because of that, the minotaur as a character is sometimes used to represent the autistic child or the autistic experience. Um, I've given you a, a picture there of a, a novel by uh, Barbara Vine, uh, Ruth Rendell, uh, called The Minotaur, which is about um, an autistic man who is, um, uh, he spends a lot of time in his library, which is constructed like a labyrinth and um, he's actually um, 
sort of framed by his family who treat him as a monster and um, they commit a murder and blame it on him. So um, the, the monstrous aspect um, is, is very important to the plot. Um, there's a great book by Liz Gloin called Tracking Classical Monsters in Popular Culture, which has a whole section on this and a, a very good Minotaur chapter. So the Minotaur, in the sense that he is locked away, he is spurned by his family, um, this very much taps into the traditional, um, to the history, if you like, of uh, autism representations. Um, he's also male, which, as I've mentioned, is, is a key um, element to the understanding of autism. And he's unable to um, speak the Minotaur, is unable to speak when he has the head of a bull, but he doesn't always have the head of a bull. In lots of older representations, um, he's, um, his hybrid nature comes out more like a centaur. Um, and so the, the fact that he can't speak is actually, um, it, it's, it's not a fixed point, really. So... What I'm concerned about is whether this identification that's often made with the, what we could see as a kind of monstrous other, uh, whether it can ever be positive and whether we can use it to help autistic children. And I think, yes. Um, the Minotaur's labyrinth in art and literature is also used to represent home, control and safety. Um, Going back to what I asked you to do with the switching off of the cameras, with um, adapting your environment to become more comfortable, these are all elements which are really important to autistic children and autistic people in general, the ability to control what's going on around you. Um, and there's a really interesting short story by uh, the Argentinian writer Borges um, called The House of Asterion. And in it, the Minotaur is the main character and we see everything from the Minotaur's point of view. We see how much he enjoys being in his house, which is what he calls the labyrinth. And he says, the doors are always open. Um, anyone can enter. There are no locked doors. There are no locks. Um, it's, he can go out and other people can come in. The fact that they don't is just a, an inconvenience. And it, it's a lovely, lovely story. I mean, it's very sad um, because, you know, it doesn't go well at the end. Um, but it's a lovely story and it really captures a lot of the autistic experience. It was also drawn on by Susanna Clarke in her recent novel, Piranesi, which is substantially based on the House of Asterion. And, and if you read that, you see minotaurs coming up over and over again. Um, right, I will try and get through this very <laughs> quickly. Um, another topic that it brings us to is the importance of a name. Um, Asterion is the name for the Minotaur in a lot of the ancient sources. Uh, it maybe means starry or something to do with stars, and it's a family name. And this also taps into some issues that we deal with with autistic children. I refer to myself as autistic. I refer to my son as autistic. That's because that's the overwhelming preference for autistic people. We don't want to be called a person with autism. It suggests we can be separated from the workings of our own brains. Um, we don't want to be called on the spectrum because that suggests that autistic is a bad word. Um, there are a lot of concerns over terminology and names and naming and what sort of name um, you want to take. And also labeling, that's a whole other discussion and uh, sadly one I don't have time to get into, but it's, it's a, a very interesting direction to take things in. And it, it very um, clearly applies to the Minotaur and the notion of the Minotaur having a name. So finally, <laughs> I'm just about done <laughs> talking really fast. Um, bringing it back to the theme of the conference, Speaking up and speaking out isn't always possible for autistic children. They, they, some of them are nonverbal. Some of them prefer not to talk. Speaking out is not something that they can do. 
even when they do, even when they do speak out, even when they do communicate, as my son did to me when he was hiding under the chairs, it only works when neurotypical people listen and understand and take notice. And that's the big thing. You know, communication only works if somebody's listening. So often the most important thing is not actually speech, but it's control of choices and environment and getting to make those choices and adapt that environment um, without necessarily needing to communicate. And finally, communication can be achieved in lots of ways. It doesn't have to be about speech. It doesn't have to be about any of the forms that we're accustomed to. Um, entering the child's world, rather than forcing the child to come out and meet you in yours, is a very valid way of dealing with the problems. And increasingly is becoming a focus of um, therapeutic techniques. So um, that's really, <laughs> <laughs> a load of the points that I wanted to touch on. It's a bit of a, a labyrinth of um, uh, ideas and materials and links, um, which I would love to have a whole afternoon to develop properly. But um, if you would like to get in touch with me at any point about any of this, um, there's my email address. And you can also find me on Twitter. Um, there's a link there to an interview that I did with um, Susan DC's organization, uh, the Acclaim Network, and also a thing that I wrote for um, education blog about dealing with um, neurodiverse students online. Um. Mm -hmm.